We are, what are the essential, the essential and heartfelt ideals for your campaign? That's a question to Mr. Alexander White. Um, am I supposed to answer now? Yes, you are. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm so glad to see so many people here. I Can you hear me? Do I need this? <laughs> That's what I was hoping. Not a huge Mike fan. The uh, I used to teach, and I can do a much louder voice if I needed to. The uh, um, uh, I uh, want to thank you all for coming. It's nice to see so many people and so many faces I do recognize. I uh, one of these days I think I'll get to know all of your names too. The uh, um, but uh, what I want to focus on is mayor is what I think is the underlying root problem that Rochester faces, and that's poverty. I love it when the mayor said, we had, in the last four years, we'd had 1.7 billion with a B invested in Rochester. Well, where were the jobs? We're still running a $30 million deficit in our budget every year. Where were the taxes? The problem with this investment is we got nothing for it but the bill. When I look at some of the projects in this, I look at things like Alexander Park. I look at the, which uh, for, 98, for $89 million of investment is going to pay a $5,575 taxes this year. I look at Erie Harbor, $49 million investment, almost $6 million from the city, and yet it's going to pay $7,400 in taxes. Your, uh, Culver Road Armory, I can go on, but $15 million, going to pay $2,926 taxes. This investment is not creating jobs because it's going to landlords. More than 50% of it is residential. We've invested the city itself last year invested $65 million in these projects, and yet we still don't have jobs. As mayor, I want to focus on the people. I want to focus on bringing jobs in. I want to get jobs to all kids who can graduate their grade in high school so that these kids don't go to the drug dealers looking for jobs. I want to be able to get police into the neighborhoods because we have enough to put eight police in every square mile of the city every day. And I want to be able to try to reduce the crime by, by concentrating on both poverty and enforcement so we can improve our neighborhoods. When I go through neighborhoods, I see vacant houses and vacant lots. But what I'm really seeing is an opportunity. The vacant houses are opportunities to do an urban homesteading program to fill, fix those houses with local people and use those houses for, to get homeowners into them who will pay taxes. When I see vacant lots, I look at, I see opportunities for gardening and I see opportunities for development. This is where we can be if we weren't giving all of the money away to the developers. As mayor, that's what I'm offering. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have to eliminate the rebuttal. <laughs> well, it'll just short. If somebody else want to be butter with the mayor, I don't know. But uh, thank you. First question that our citizens and our residents have put out was concerning citizen input. I'm going to read the questions and then you can answer. Sure. Okay. Besides education, do you, do you think that there are any aspects of the budget that are off limits to citizen input? What types of budget decisions will be open for citizen input? Three. The, what percentage of the budget items is off open for citizen input? How much weight will citizens' input play in the budget making process? And what process will be used to gather citizen input? The, uh, uh, there's a couple things here that I want to talk about. On the budget, of course, there's things like pensions and whatnot. It's it, Obviously, the citizens can't have an input on. There are some things that are mandated by the state that we have to do, and there's very little input on that. But there's a lot of remaining money. And a lot of projects get decided on. A lot of things get decided on. Simple things like which road to repair. 
and whether we should put trees along our streets or whether we should have extra cops. And I think that we need to return to a system more like the sector system we used to have, where the sectors would actually meet and discuss what they wanted, and budgets would be built around that. I, I like the Green Party, the entire Green Party is for something called um, citizen budgeting, which is a process in which groups will get together and say, our neighborhood needs this. Amounts of money will be set available for this so that the neighborhoods can actually decide do they want this or that. The process, like all of democracy, is kind of messy. Um, there'll be a lot of people saying one thing or another, but this will come down to it. Uh, um, uh, these smaller groups will get together and then they will uh, and then they will try to decide and present their arguments, and then we will decide what it is that needs to be done most. And this is best used on things like when there is development money to be used. So with my plan about rebuilding houses, obviously we're not going to be able to rebuild every house. And obviously someone's going to look at some of the houses and say some can't be rebuilt. But we're going to be able to come to neighborhood groups and say, listen, what are your top five houses you want rebuilt? What are your three you want torn down? That's what we got for you this year. Tell us what to do. And the process is going to look like meetings like this, with people like me sitting in front of you say, with a map saying, here it is, here are your choices. What would you like done? And uh, uh, among other, th but that's only part of the transparency I'm looking for as mayor. I want to have many more meetings with the public. I want to have a radio show with call-in that once a month at least you're able to talk to the mayor or listen to what they're doing because in many cases the things are going on in city council that are very important to you. And it's important that, we, that the citizens know what council is doing so that they're not giving away buildings for $2 to <laughs> campaign donors. <coughs> And so that you have an opportunity to let them, to let our citizens, to let our leaders know what it is that they're doing wrong. And so I intend to be much more transparent in our present government. Thank you. I have a question concerning the percentage. The what, can, can you give us the percentage of the citizen input? I, 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 uh, the percentage of the budget that oh, you okay. will let the citizens have a voice on? Um, from my look at the budget, really, um, I don't know if there's going to be any input on uh, 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 the salary, staffing, things like that. And when we're done, there's really only a uh, capital improvement budget, which I think is about uh, 60 to $100 million every year, which I think the citizen should have 100% input on. Um, but that's about a fifth of the total budget in that neighborhood, somewhere between a fifth and an eighth, depending on how much in it is in it every year. But, you know, there's a lot of things that they, you know, like the communications department. You're not going to have an input on whether we have how many people are in the communications budget, in the communications department. You're not going to have a budget, a, a, the citizens aren't going to have a say on how many people are involved in printing the, uh, doing the printing for the city to send out bills and other things. But there is a lot of discretionary money that it, it's spent on various things, uh, cameras, other services, and the citizens have a right to have direct input on all of that. And it's going to be something about a fifth to an eighth of the budget. Um, I guess I was more or less going on, 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 on the area about if, if, if extra funding was, was given for neighborhoods, service centers, rec centers, policing, et cetera, what would be done with the extra funding, for example, training, extra personnel, system upgrades, and, and, and youth interns? Um, there's a lot in that question. Yes, it is. The, uh, um, every year in April, I speak to city council about needing more funding for recreation. 
And recreation has been one of the things for years that I've talked about. We need more programs, more staffing, longer hours. Libraries, they were closed this year during the summer on weekends. Um, and that's something that's unacceptable to me. The, uh, 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 these are valuable parts of our city that are used by people. Some of that extra, some of the extra money in libraries or recreation is going to go to staffing. There's going to be more hiring because I want more hours. There's a program that worked fairly well in other places called Friday Night Basketball. It's the concept that you keep the rec centers on weekends open much later, maybe to 2 in the morning, and you provide activities for the kids there to participate in. That's going to need staffing. There's going to be hiring involved in that. In neighborhoods, I really like the Adopt the Neighborhood program. I, rather than clean sweep, I like there being people that neighborhood, get, that neighborhood block groups get to hire to pick up the trash in their neighborhood block on a part-time basis You're, during the summer. It's going to be more hiring. One of the things I want to focus on really is about how we increase jobs. And some of this is going to be rolled into my teen hiring program because I really want to provide kids who can pass school a job in the summer. Because as a small business owner, the number one question I get asked every summer is, are you hiring? And I believe there's about 8,000 kids that are looking for that job. So we need to do something so that they're not asking the drug dealers, are you hiring? <laughs> okay. Um, will you institute city department spending, reporting, and budgeting projections by quadrant? I've, I've, I've heard this question before. I'm really not certain. I mean, I've read every budget for a decade, and I'm not certain I can break it down that way. And I don't know if our budget director can break it down that way. The problem behind this question is not about budgeting, it's about lack of services. And this is really a question about the fact that the northeast of the city has many needs. And the northwest similarly has, has the similar sort of needs and is getting short shrift on everything as far as staffing of police, as far as budgeting, as far as development money, and uh, where the need is greatest, we're spending the least. I live in the South Wedge for full disclosure. We really don't want for anything. <laughs> and uh, it seems to me that that's a backwards way of doing budgeting. And I know I'm sitting in front of a group of people from the Northeast, but I also know that uh, when uh, when a group of residents thought it would help slow down traffic to paint the street. And they asked the city for a little money and the city never found it. I know neighbors in the area found the paint needed. And the street got painted. And I know that uh, when little things like that are lacking in the South Wedge, we come up with it. Mm -hmm. But some of, the, some of the census tracts up in the northeast of the city have an average household income of $11,000. At that point, you can't ask anyone for donations. So we need to concentrate where the money's going to do the most good. And really, it's about quality of life issues. And if we don't do something to kind of raise up these problems, all we're going to do is end up with worse ones, which are going to spread. And instead, we need to concentrate on stopping them and, you know, I can't promise you there's a way, I mean, just off the top of my head with what I know about budgeting, I don't even know if there's a way to do what I'm being asked. But what I do know is that there is a way to provide better services. And uh, uh, things like we spent a million dollars to build a police station downtown at the Sibley building where crime is leased. We should find ways to get police stations in the places where the police are actually needed. We should find a way to get more officers here. We should find a way to concentrate if, if and this is another thing. The city has spent so much money on developing buildings in the, south, in the southeastern section of Rochester. And if you believed that created jobs, you would want that in the northeast or the northwest section where poverty is much worse. I don't believe they create jobs, but I believe if that spending was spent up here, we could create jobs up here, rebuilding these vacant houses, and then we could make a world of difference. That's my next question. Everybody agreed that quadrants with more serious needs should get more resources on those issues. 
what role will citizens play in determining that process? The uh, uh, again, we're going to have to we're going to have to sit down with the residents and have budgeting and come up with the first thing you do in that is come up with needs. And what's going to happen is groups are going to come up with needs, and then we're going to have to look at them and consider things like so. In the southeast, there's a need for more street decorations. And in the northwest, there's a need for in the northwest there's a need for uh, 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 for more policing. One's more important than the other, and the citizens need to stress what it is that the problems are, so that we can prioritize that and assign money that people can decide how they specifically want that money used. Wow, that was short. <laughs> so um, how would you involve citizens holding the system accountable in terms of creating and measures of success and performance for city services? Without violating civil service laws and union contracts, how could you involve citizens? Um, wow, probably you can't. I mean, I hate to tell you that answer, but uh, uh, there's virtually no, I mean, unions have very specific, specific rules about uh, doing performance reviews, and the citizens are presently not included in that. We need to rewrite contracts. That's going to take time and something I'm not opposed to. Um, the, uh, because, uh, uh, and, you know, I've been to so many of these meetings and I've listened to so many people complain about the house that's caught on fire so many times right next to theirs. And it's been vacant for a decade and nothing's done about it. And you're at wit's end and you come to one of these meetings and some city council member presently says, oh, send me an email and we'll get right on it. It shouldn't require a city council member to take an active interest in a burned out building that needs to become down. There, if the procedures and policies that are in place aren't working, we have to make it so that we're collecting that information and we're acting on it because at the moment our 311 system does a terrible job of collecting this sort of information. When people call up and say such and such is not happening, the trash isn't being collected, the uh, houses are not being taken care of, inspectors are not coming around, police are not responding to calls. All of this are things that get called into 311 all the time. And this information needs to be collected needs to be made available so that we have this to work on trying to improve government because you the people are what's important. Presently it seems to me from my experience that government is about the buildings. The mayor and the mayor's office and the city council members are all so concerned about building. If you listen to Dana Miller, he talked about all the building things he did, but he didn't talk about how he improved people's lives. And that's what I really want to do, and input from the residents is essential to that. Um, we're going to thank you for your questions and your answers. Sure. Um, that'll be the end of this one, but we want to know that um, we want to open the floor for questions. If anybody has any questions for Mr. White, you can ask him now. We got a question back here. Hi. Right. Would you state Jean. your name? Yes, please. Thank My you. name is Jean, and um, I was wondering, what are your plans, or how are we going to get our children to be more successful in school? What concrete measures are you going to implement to ensure that the kids are reading at grade level prior to first grade, because um, it, it seems like we've been doing things backwards. You cannot wait until seventh grade and discover that a kid is failing, then you put academic intervention in place. Then lo and behold, they have the Regents exam and still not able to read. And it's been, I've lived in this city for over 35 years. And I have school-aged children, and I am a grandmother, and the problem goes on and on. You give the teachers extra hours, 
you send the school, the kid to school one hour early in the morning and they stay one hour early, later at night and we are not getting anywhere. The, it's, uh, the statistics is 4% of African American children <coughs> were able to pass their regents exam and that is really not acceptable. It's not acceptable. The education system in Rochester is failing too many students. Um, I'm not running for school board. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's I was a teacher, and I have a lot of ideas about teaching. But the mayor has very little they can do about the actual application of education. What the mayor's office does with education is provide funding. That's the sole part. And there are things that I know will improve the reading in, school, in our city. Uh, reading teachers um, and uh, uh, more early childhood education, uh, preschools and daycares. I know all this will work. The city, the city schools claim every year they don't have money. One of the things that has happened is our district and our city have not worked very well together to provide the funding necessary for what is net for what for what is determined to be needed i intend to work with the district i intend to have the district be able to come and say it'll be three million dollars for four full day for four-year-old preschool can you do this and i intend to try to find that money because in my mind it comes down to a choice do we want to get do we want the, the capron street uh, uh, loft apartments to get $4.2 million of tax breaks, or do I want four-year-olds to have day, full day, day, full day preschool? Um, I also feel that one of the problems as we move along is a lack of hope. Too many of our students feel that the outcome of education is a job at McDonald's, and that doesn't convince them to try very hard. And the lure of the streets with that quick, quick 40 bucks they can make in 10 hours of work a day seems like a lot to these kids. And what I want to do is change that way of thinking. Uh, and that's why jobs needs to be the focus. I've got a minute to explain an extensive job program. Um, I want to use the budgeting that the, pre city, the purchasing the city and the district presently has to focus more locally on local jobs and if it's possible to actually create jobs in which the workers will be the owners uh, to create things that we need and purchase in the area. I want to work with institutions that aren't going anywhere to create other things like laundry mats and whatnot that will be needed by, for example, uh, senior citizen center, senior centers and nursing homes and whatnot. And I want to rebuild the houses in our neighborhood. I want to do all of this mainly for job creation and the students who can work that summer job I've mentioned. If they can work that summer job and get through that summer job, I want to give them a stipend of $20 a week as long as they stay in school and meet some simple criteria the district sets with the city. I think this will make a huge impact on getting kids to continue to stay to graduate. Thank you. Question here? Um, I'm Carl Nesbitt. Hi, Carl. There's a two-part question I have. Hickey Freeman has been sold and I'm wrong. Three years ago, the city gave Hickey Freeman all kind of money for taxes for them to stay here. So after that, Hickey Freeman took the tax money, bingo, sold it. Sold it to another company, out of state, out of town, or something. Canada. How much money taxes did uh, Rochester offer these people to come here because they mentioned nothing about hiring people, they just coming in here, taking over, which, therefore, they don't sell anything that a poor man can afford for his clothing is concerned. <laughs> so it's just a big old factory there that we're supporting, our tax money supporting, that are being taken from us. Is the city going to reimburse us some of this money that they gave Hickey Freeman from the first beginning? Oh, that money's gone, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, 
That money's gone. The first purchaser, and I can't remember the name of them, has taken that money, stuck it in their pocket, and gone to the bank with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're picking on Hickey Freeman. Um, uh, there are so many examples of companies. Xerox is a great example. Did it, Bausch and Lam. Um, but I concentrate a lot on the developers. I mean, they're also taking millions of dollars to build things. Um, the, uh, the Midtown Tower was sold for $2 million, and then the city gave, has given $8.7 million additional to go with $6 million from the state on a project that they think will cost maybe, four, maybe $50 million. We've now given almost 30% of the total cost of the project. Well, ain't nobody going to be held accountable for that? Uh, well, I'd like to put an end to projects like that. Okay, that is what I'm running about. That sort of giveaway needs to stop because that's our money. It's not creating jobs. It's not generating tax revenue. There is no benefit we're getting from that. And that's what I want to see an end put to. And if Hickey Freeman is going to be sold again, I'd like to see the workers at Hickey Freeman buy the company. Mm -hmm. Because once the, work, once, the, once the company is locally owned, it can't be blackmailed again. And this is one of our big problems, is that these companies keep coming every couple years and saying, I need more money. I need more tax breaks. And they feel they have us over a barrel, and every year we have to cough up more of our cash. Um, so what I would like to see is I'd like to see jobs concentrated in the workers in the neighborhood owning that company. And it can be done in Cleveland. There's something called the Cleveland Foundation. I'm not going to leave you anything to talk about, am I? <laughs> um, the Cleveland Foundation, which actually has created about 500 jobs uh, locally in Cleveland on a $38 million investment, I believe. And that investment was a loan that these companies are all paying back. Substantial difference from what we're looking at here. Is there a hand right here? Yes. Uh, Thomas Hedrick. Hi. Um, you said that um, the police aren't needed downtown. You said that they don't need a million dollar, um, I guess, a substation police downtown. Station. Police substation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you don't think they're needed down there? Well, it's not that we don't need it. It's not that we can go without any police downtown. There's no place in the city you can deprive entirely of police. But we have police officers acting as crossing guards at, uh, I believe, four or six intersections. Mm -hmm. Now, the city used to pay for crossing guards at the high schools. But just two years ago, our council, in their infinite wisdom, decided that teenagers should be able to cross the street without a crossing guard and cut the funding to that. Right about the same time, they started putting police officers to act as crossing guards downtown. Uh, I wasn't sure what you were talking about. What, I'm, what I feel is that they, put, they built a police station less than a mile than the already existing police station. Okay? You can walk that distance from the Sibley building to the public safety building in about five minutes. Why did we need a substation five minutes walking from the station? That's crazy. And we have so many police officers downtown during the day. It far exceeds the level of threat and the violence. It, it, there's no justification for this, none whatsoever. And if you look at the city of Rochester as a whole, and you say, we're going to divide it up into neighborhoods. No neighborhood has as many officers per square mile as downtown True. during the day. And there's less crime downtown than there is in almost any other neighborhood in the city. It's just about the least crime with the most officers. That seems backwards. And this is my example that Shepard is bad at managing the department because he's putting officers where they're not needed and depriving them from areas where they are needed. And that's just insane. Well, I know they're down there for the, uh, the truancy and other issues, um, things like that. You do remember we had that shooting uh, 
a few weeks ago. I know we need some police down there, but yeah, we don't need as many as we've got. No. It, it's about, there's, there's only so many officers, there's only so many, do, do we only have so many officers. And with those officers, we need to employ them in a way that they're in places where they can actually deter crime. And the problem downtown has a lot to do with insisting on using our GRTA buses for high school kids. And this is a real problem because the kids get on an RGRTA bus, are bus basically unsupervised, get off an RGRTA bus where they're supposed to transfer, which sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. This is a great opportunity for them to not go to school. On the way back, they again get to get off a bus to do a transfer, and if they don't catch the immediate transfer, they can wait, there'll be another one, and there'll be another one after that, and another one after that. So there's no incentive for them to actually get home. If we change to regular school buses, I actually believe that the contracts will end up working out that the actual payment will be identical because the, the state reimburses 90% of all transportation. But I also believe that uh, uh, it would make a huge impact on violence and crime and truancy downtown because the buses will pick up the kids at the, near their houses and drop the kids off actually at the school with no opportunity to get off and get lost and to get in trouble. If you saw the article in the paper, you saw that a lot of uh, the money that the bus company gets, they get from contracts. They don't get it from the state. That, well, they get uh, 10 point some million dollars from this contract with our GRTA but with the city school district. But the question is not whether this is important funding for RGRTA. I'm sorry, I don't care so much about that. What I care about is, is this the appropriate and best way to transport our students? Because they should be first, not, pro not, not operating budgets for RGRTA. Okay. We have a question in the back. Uh, you know, here in the Northeast, the quality of life issues are never addressed. So many people from the Northeast leave because the noise ordinance is not followed through. Around our schools, the drug-free zones are not enforced. On the 14621, we have tripled the highest level three sex offenders in the county. We have clusters of probation. We have nonprofits filling our communities full of uh, people on parole and probation and sex offenders and the most homeless. Now, we believe in helping everybody out. But when we need businesses in our community, when we need to improve our quality of life and improve our tax base. How can we do this if we're the dumping ground for the county? The, uh, uh, there were a couple questions in here, and I'm going to start with noise. Um, the last year I have any records on this, the city wrote 300 and some noise tickets, I think it was 340, and that was in 2009. Um, and uh, uh, the city that year wrote, I believe, and again, off my memory from four-year-old statistics, I'm trying to remember, I believe it was 12,000 traffic tickets. Now, if I want to know what improves quality of life, the noise is way more important than the traffic tickets. Admittedly, we don't want people running stop signs and whatnot, but noise as often is everyone in this room should know an indicator for pro other problems. They play the noise loud in to see what the police response time is. They play the noise loud to test the neighbors. They play the noise loud to really drive out the good people because this allows them, really drug houses require destabilized neighborhoods to exist. And this is one of the tools used to destabilize neighborhoods. Trash is another one, bullying, residents, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So these are all strategies that are being used in order to try to destabilize neighborhoods to make it a better place to do their drug sales and their drug houses. And it doesn't help that there's a huge population of people in, the, in sections of the city that are very concentrated and inevitably poor and with some real stress issues in their lives 
whether it's getting out of prison or whether it's some other, uh, whether they're sex offenders getting out of prison, mentally unstable, or some, or even physically uh, uh, disabled in some way. All of these people being dumped in an area actually has a negative impact upon the ability to deal with neighborhoods. And we need to look at that because we need to make developing neighborhoods a concentration. Uh, and that's, we're going to go back to that vacant houses. We get neighbors to own and to move into those vacant houses by doing an urban homesteading program where we basically give those buildings away on conditions people stay and live in them, we'll be starting to get good neighbors in. And then we can dilute the population of the bad neighbors, but we have to concentrate in officers in areas with high offense rates. By my plan, there's eight officers per square mile. If we put two in every square, square mile per Per, per op time, we have one, two other officers per day. And those officers need to be do supervision, but also need to concentrate on quality of life. Because we need to start cracking down on those things like noise that make living in this city unpleasant. And the enforcement of the, the drug-free zones and the clusters of drug uh, sex offenders and the cluster of pre-pump pole inflation, how would you address that issue? How do we address that issue? You start fighting more aggressively with the state and county officials about the placement because they're choosing this area because of low housing values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really why they're choosing this area. Mm -hmm. And until we can do something about the housing values, they're going to continue to do so. And the mayor really has no tool to stop this. Now, one of the reasons to put more schools in a district, at least for the sex offenders, is there are places in uh, other towns that have used school placement as a way to chase out sex offenders by mapping it out so there's no place to put anyone. I'm not certain that's the direction I want to go, but I am certain that what we need to do is start by raising housing values, which is targeting vacant houses and vacant properties, which will start making it so that there's other places that county and the state can start placing people. I have one more question. Uh, on what he was saying about the sex offenders and the, uh, the druggies and whatever that's being dumped in our neighborhoods, which we know that are being dumped in there, they build in St. Francis House a little bit bigger so they can put more in. The, uh, so how, how is that going to keep us from getting these people dumped on us, and they are building places, brand new places, that are not hiring people of color. You keep saying that you want jobs, but you're not hiring people of color. Back in the 60s and the 70s, most of the people that were doing construction work were black people. But now you have people of Caucasian persuasion doing these jobs because they pay more now. Mm -hmm. And I've been by different construction places and seen that there were no people of color in these jobs. The uh, 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 racism is uh, alive and well in Rochester, oh, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> oh, I and uh, we need to start addressing, I mean, uh, last time I talked about project labor agreements, when I ran in 2011 a lot, the city's actually started to use them. Community benefit agreements can also be used to try to increase that. But the real answer is, when the city starts doing this, we need to make sure that it's focused in the neighborhoods where this is happening. If we're looking about maybe doing, let's say, 200 houses a year for rehabbing, what we're looking at is in every quadrant, we're going to do 50 on average, but in some quadrants, we're going to do maybe 75 to 100. Because honestly, there aren't that many to do in the southeast quadrant. Mm -hmm. There may not be many at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they, in fact, I think they might have fixed the last one just uh, last week. And so instead, if we're doing 100 houses in the northeast section of Rochester, we need to make sure that almost all the workers on that can walk to, the, to these houses. Mm -hmm. Because the real solution is focusing the jobs in the neighborhood where the work is happening. And, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's very, I'm a white guy sitting up here, okay? And honestly, 
You know, I have not experienced racism like you have, and I have a very hard time with it. And because I don't see it, because it's hidden from me. And when I'm, as mayor, we need to get the residents involved so that we can make sure that the residents are the one benefiting. And with hiring programs like the jobs that I was talking about with replacement, what they did in Cleveland is they made them, and, and in St. Louis as well, geographically centered. And so that the workplace is based, and let's say there's plenty of space here on Portland Avenue. Let's say we want to put in a green laundry mat in Portland Avenue. Plenty of space for it. And then they say that everyone who works there has to be within, and they usually set a distance of one mile. They have to live within one mile. And they did this in Cleveland, they did this in St. Louis, and what it did was these jobs actually brought money right into this neighborhood, which actually meant that someone opened a store selling things other than tobacco, alcohol, and, sick, and uh, uh, lottery tickets, which actually started to make a huge impact in the neighborhood because now there was money and it was circulating in we can actually start to make a change with that and by focusing it geographically, in many cases you solve that issue of racism. Okay. We want to thank everybody for, the, okay, one more question. We can quit. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, hi, my name is Lori, Lori Bosmus, and one of the um, problems that I see a lot and it's because of um, majorly in our neighborhood, I'm in the Northeast section as well, is that there are a lot of, um, not a lot of ownership in our neighborhoods. There's a lot of renters. And we're, we no longer have those incentives programs that used to come from the city. Uh, like back in the 90s, you had the lottery, you had the, um, certain grants that you can um, use to repair your homes and all that stuff. Even the grassroots organizations are not funded enough, the money's not trickling down enough to improve our neighborhoods. And um, and we also had, there was a, some time ago where we were supposed to have this public um, mini market right on Clinton Avenue, right across from yeah. St. Michael's. Mm -hmm. All that went downhill. So, yes. <laughs> so I'm like, are we going to get those programs in again? Because even these new projects that are being built in our neighborhood, they're not um, owners, they're yeah. rental properties. Mm -hmm. The, um, uh, my opponent, has been on city council for six years and represents your area. Okay? How is she doing at that? Last year, $65 million, more than $65 million, was spent on these big project developments. And under $3 million was available for emergency home repair and other projects like that. So if you wanted to like fix the roof on your house or there was an emergency, there was one less than a 20th of the money that went to big project was available to homeowners. Mm -hmm. And there are, project, there are programs that pay uh, uh, the closing costs on first time purchases and there's some others like that. But the total amount available is under $3 million. I think that ratio is backwards. And what I think is that, uh, like urban homesteading went, we haven't had that program in over 20 years. I'd like to go back to that. I'd like to go back to projects in that, um, in that we were actually providing money available as loans. Uh, we gave out, for College Town, we gave out more than $20 million of loans. It was approved by city council unanimously. Everyone on city council thought that was a great idea. And these loans are 1% paid for out of taxes. And their tax rate of College Town is, was set at virtually a third of what the total project cost was. So what they really did was they said, we'll loan you some money, I'll lower your taxes by a third, and don't worry paying it back. Now what if that $20 million, which is a Section 108 uh, uh, HUD loan, which is for removing blight in neighborhoods, could easily have been used in neighborhoods as small interest loans for repairing problems in your neighborhoods and encouraging home ownership. That money could have been used for that according to the charter at uh, HUD. And if we had, what a difference we would have made in this neighborhood. Exactly. And 
this is where I'm at. I've been sitting watching council for years, and they continue to have no trouble voting these millions of dollars for these huge developers. And it seems that they always struggle to find a couple thousand, hundreds of thousands for neighbors. I haven't been on council. I'm not responsible for this. And it will change because I don't have these big donors. These developers have not given me any money, and I would return it if they did. Because I don't want to feel beholden to them. I want to be beholden to you, the public. You're the only people that I want to be responsible to. You want to thank you for coming, Mr. White? Oh, my pleasure. And no more questions. <coughs> I don't think we have no more. We have lovely Warren. We're going to give her a chance to have a few comments, too, if it's possible. You want me to go ahead? Yeah, you want me to leave? Oh, thank you. Can you stay here? <laughs> Is that a problem? Um, now everything's confused. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm. Um, um, <laughs> I'm not confused. Um, I apologize to all of you because I had several events that I had to go to tonight, but wanted to make sure that I get here to answer any questions that you may have um, for me. Um, I was born and raised in the city of Rochester. I believe in this city, and I know that we have some work to do to make it come back. We are the tale of two cities. And when I say that, we have a city that's moving forward. You know. Um, Mr. White likes to talk about what we do as it pertains to development and other um, projects like that. Um, but we need those projects in order to build up. Most people talk about what's happening in our downtown, what's happening around our colleges, what's happening um, when it comes to the Port of Rochester. And people want those types of development and people in the neighborhood want them. Can we do some things a little bit better? I'm not going to say that we can't, but we can't. But when it comes to our neighborhoods, we have failed to really effectively move our neighborhoods forward. When it comes down to crime and, and, and open air drug markets, when it also comes down to housing development, um, we tend to want to continue to concentrate poverty in a specific area, and that has essentially destroyed many of our communities, and I think that that needs to change. There are people all across the country that have figured out how to do this type of development the right way, and I will be looking to do that. Um, when it pertains to education, Mr. White wants to fund the school district and continue to fund the school district and says that the mayor has no business in the school district. I disagree. The mayor has to take on the issue of our schools. Because what happens if we do not get involved in our school districts, you continue to see what's happening right now. Um, we have a number of people that are miseducated, that are just being prepared to go to jail or in the ground. Um, just Sunday, we experienced an 11-year-old being caught in a crossfire in the middle of the day. This has to stop. It has to stop. Um, I am prepared to work with our community and our neighbors and our police department to make sure that we make crime um, and take crime seriously when it comes down to this open air drug market. Um, I have represented Northeast Rochester for six years. I know the challenges that we face as a community. Um, I have worked tirelessly and hard with many of the community associations and people in this room to try to move that mark forward. And we've done some good work together. I know that we can do even better work if um, from the mayor's seat in making sure that this area gets what it's due when it pertains to development as well as to jobs. We have to start focusing on how we can put people back to work. If, we're, if people are properly educated, if we are able to put them to work, I believe that the crime will start to take care of itself. Looking forward to working with each of you um, come November 5th, if I'm elected um, as your mayor, to make sure that we put the people of our city first. Um, and I, you know, I continue to do that, um, you know, rather I'm in the mayor's seat or just city council president. Um, I believe in serving the people and being of service to you. We want to thank Lovey Warren for her statement. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Warren? 
I have a few questions before we sworn. My name is Jean, and I was wondering how can we as a community help our children to be better educated and prepared for these jobs we're talking about? We know them well, they cannot read. Where are you going to work? Mm -hmm. When well, most places you have to do a reading and writing test anyways. So how are we going to measure? And we do a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. And have been doing a lot of talking. What we need to see is some results. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get our first graders to be reading at first grade level when they get to first grade? Mm -hmm. And this is for everybody. Mothers and fathers and grandmothers and everybody. Well, I think it is a holistic approach. Part of it, we have to lay the blame at home where we have to work with our parents to make sure that they understand that they have a role to play in their children's education. Everybody here knows 5210, be a healthy hero. Um, when we talk about young kids and obesity, what the Greater Rochester Health Foundation did, they went on a crusade to say we're going to end obesity. Well, we need to go on a crusade around literacy and say we need to end literacy and bring parents to the table as a partner to say, how do we help you at home or develop the skills at home so that we can make sure our children are getting the proper work that they need and support at home? That's part of it. Second of all, even if the parent is not equipped, maybe the parent is illiterate, we need to be able to utilize our recreation centers in a way to give the parents options to come in and learn how to read with their child and not feel bad about that. And so I would like to make sure that our recreation centers and our community centers are actually being utilized by the entire community. A third thing that I think that we need to do is hold our school district accountable for educating children. I would like to open up the door to charter schools that have a proven success rate in urban education. The number one reason why middle class families leave the city of Rochester is because of the educational system. That's the number one reason, not anything else. The number one reason is because of the educational system. And they can put their home up for sale and move 15 minutes away and to Brighton and to Greece and you know send their children to a better school. Poor people don't have that benefit. They cannot vote with their feet. But their children deserve the same education and access to the quality education as everybody else. They have a constitutional right to it. My daughter is three years old. She currently attends the Montessori school. The same issues, concerns that you as a parent have and everyone here for their children and grandchildren, I have that same concern. Will our school district be able to continue to educate my child? But the difference is I may be able to send my child to a private school. But the same quality education that I want for mine, I want for everybody's. And I'm going to hold people accountable to make sure that they do that. Ms. Ma'am. Yeah, I was... Uh, it, it, she was talking about the education of the children. I have grandchildren too, and they in the city school district. But what I was thinking about was seven percent of all of Monroe County. I mean, seven percent out of the United States, uh, uh, Rochester child hunger. There's a lot of children that go to school hungry, mm -hmm. and they can't, how can you educate somebody when their bellies are growling? Well, we are seventh in the nation for childhood poverty, yeah. but what we also provide our children, um, all children that come to our schools are given free breakfast mm -hmm. and free lunch, and many of them that attend our recreation center, they're provided with dinner. We, we do have, um, we are very good at making sure that children have access to quality food. And one of the things that I know that the neighbors in the neighborhoods have done, um, have worked to do community gardens, where they actually give food away to many people that live in the community, and that's why they've started one just down the street from here, the Peace Garden, um, that was started by the Portland Avenue uh, Business Association. I know on Carl Street, Mrs. Canty is here. She has another garden that she gives away um, healthy fruits and vegetables. And we have in Northeast Rochester a number of gardens. And one of the things that I did uh, when we started to see our gardens, um, basically after Bridges to Wellness did their garden um, up on um, upper part of Portland Avenue or North Street, um, they had this sign 
So we have uniform signs at our gardens in Northeast Rochester, which I think uh, makes us unique and makes us, you know, make allows people to know that here's this garden that the community has developed for the community, and the food is given away to people that are in need. But children that attend our city schools. All of them are provided with free breakfast, free lunch, and as well as if they go to our community centers, they are given food there as well. Hold on, sir. Um, Hector, yes. Uh, yeah. You already know this, that until you came out, our representative, most of our issues were never addressed. They were just overlooked. Once you become mayor, are you going to make sure that the next person representing the Northeast would be as good as you? Well, um, if I'm so lucky to become your mayor, I will not be able to choose who is the representative for Northeast Rochester. But I will say that I will, I'm hopeful to work with you to make sure that you get a representative that take your issues very, very seriously. I know one thing, you'll have someone in the mayor's seat that understands the plight of the people that live in this district, that cares about it, definitely, um, but also making sure that we uplift the entire city of Rochester as a whole. Because the issues of Northeast Rochester are the issues of many people around our city. And I believe that we can work collectively together to move the mark. And we have great people like yourself that will make sure and hold us accountable when we're not doing the right things. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. If you become mayor, is it possible that you can set up some type of training center in three sections of the city, everywhere but South Wales, they don't need it down there, <laughs> <laughs> to teach our young boys as on these corners selling the same products to learn something? Can you do that? One of the things that I've worked on as city council president, I introduced a program called Operation Transformation which literally goes after young African-American males that are on the corner that want to change their life around. One thing that I know is that most people that are out there on the corner, they feel like they don't have an alternative even if they, th even if they do. But because a lot of them have dropped out of school, they don't have a GED, they don't have a, um, they don't realize and recognize there are a lot of programs around this city to help them get their GED and into training they just decide to stand on the corner. We have to bring that message to them. One of the things that I would love to do, I, I don't know how long you've been here, but I was talking with my uncle the other day, who my family moved here from King Street, South Carolina, back in the late 1960s. When uh, my, my um, uncle started, um, he, he went in, they had a program called Manpower, where they paid people, I think it was like $59 a week or something like that to go through a year training and then they had a job. One, one of the assets that we have in the city of Rochester um, is the fact that we have very highly technical people. When you look at, at the fact that we have Bosch and Lam and Xerox and, and Kodak, we have very highly technical skilled people and those people have either started companies or they're working for companies. And then we have low skill when you're talking about the, um, the working poor. The people that are working a job, but they cannot, you know, basically they're just making ends meet or barely, you know, even making ends meet. But we have what's called a skill set deficiency, a middle skills gap, gap where um, you have these jobs in optics and advanced manufacturing, but you don't have people that are trained to fulfill them. And so we have to start matching the people to the job. I would, um, if elected mayor, go out into these businesses and say, what are the qualifications that you need? What's the training? What's the curriculum that you would like to see um, Morrow Community College and Rochester Educational Opportunity Center develop so that we can put people to work, so that when they graduate from the program, they can go automatically into a job. Um, that is something that we have to do. Um, unemployment in our most challenged neighborhoods is greater than it was during the Great Depression, and we have to stop that. Um, we have to work collectively to make sure that we're educating our people so that they can fill this middle, middle skills gap deficiency. Are there any more questions? Yes, Ms. Ken. Yes. Uh, do you agree that we need uh, more help uh, than South Wedge, uh, Corn Hill, as far as blight? and uh, proactive anti-litter programs? 
Do you, I'm sorry. What do you agree that we need more help um, in the Northeast and Northwest too? But I'm talking about the Northeast now, as far as uh, uh, proactive anti-litter programs. Um, it's filthy on the streets here, and blight caused by uh, drug dealers that move on streets and they cause other people to uh, develop uh, empathy for themselves and their children and their neighborhood. One of the things that I know is that Rochester, we have unique neighborhoods that have a different set of circumstances and different sure needs. And we tend to try to govern every neighborhood the same. And you cannot do that. What I would like to see is for us to work to govern every neighborhood based on the needs that they have. If anti-litter is what you're looking for and making sure that the neighborhood is clean, then want to be able to give you the resources to do that. If growing gardens and you know doing um, you know um, you know maybe some green you know um, when we talk about demolishing homes and other things sustainable um, demolitions and other things is something that your neighborhood would like to see and want to work with the city to develop then I would like to do that um, if focusing on stopping the crime and the drug dealers and um, the open air drug market is something that a neighborhood wants to work on I would like to see that every neighborhood and every neighborhood's needs are completely different and so you cannot govern as if they're all the same because you miss, you hit and you miss. What, um, what, you know, what we learned from the NBN process was that places like South Wedge and other places were able to take off with that process, but other areas were not as successful with utilizing the dollars that was given because of, uh, you know, uh, because of issues. And so I would like to be able to work with every neighborhood to make sure they're getting the resources that they need to do what they feel like is the best thing for their community and not what I feel is the best thing for their community. So you do agree that we need extra help, right? Oh, absolutely. We need, you know, uh, Northeast Rochester needs, a, you know, a lot of support when it comes down to, you know, especially, you know, not just anti-litter, but the concentration of poverty here, the influx of, um, you know, people that um, are entering into this community from, um, from prison. Uh, we need to have, you know, we have a lot of halfway houses in this area. And so we, we definitely have a concentration of issues here. That's why one of the things that I have supported is when we are doing these new developments, making sure that everybody gets what, you know, some of the, you know, their fair share. 80% market rate, 20% affordable housing. Uh, rather it's going in downtown, midtown, or college town, you want to be able to break up the concentration of poverty. And the way to do that is when you're doing these new developments, to make sure that everyone gets a chance to live there. Well, that's good because we're in desperate shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we somewhat went off our, our mark here, huh? There's, only, there's one more question. One more question? Okay. I'm just curious. Um, my name's Maria. <laughs> Um, I'm a homeowner, and I know everyone has um, addressed the issue of the vacant house um, problem, but I've noticed as the vacant house sits, my taxes keep going up and up. Um, is there a way that maybe as elected, and this is for the both of you, um, will there maybe find a program that we can help the homeowners that are dealing with that issue right next door, like a tax <laughs> well, one of the things in our, for me, and what I've have advocated from the city council perspective is in our focus investment neighborhoods where we're investing those dollars to try to help the homeowners that are living there, the property owners, not only just repair their home, but also uh, maybe give them some type of um, tax a break um, or, or, or tax um, incentive. Um, We've looked at that, and we continue to look at it. Look at it, and I'm willing to look at it again. Um, currently, the mayor sets the agenda. Um, the mayor sets the priorities in the, in a budget. City council, we voted up or voted down, but we don't have line item veto where we can go in and, and x something out. And on top of that, it takes nine. It takes five votes to get anything done. Um, you cannot do anything by yourself. We have to vote it up or down. Um, but many of the things that, um, you know, 
I've supported because I believe that that's the way to improve and rebuild our city. You know, we have to invest money in, um, in not only in our downtown, but also in our neighborhoods. And we have to figure out a way to rebalance ourselves, and I'm committed to doing that. Um, these vacant houses, these taxes, we need to raise your taxes every year in the city. They need to raise my taxes every year in the city. Because every year in the city, there's some new project, something. Uh, there's some developer who owns an old project whose tax breaks are running out and needs to have that extended. So he can put in new carpets, new cabinets, and new countertops. Like at 454 West Fall Road, which was unanimously voted a tax break for 20 years for that purpose for $4.1 million property, so it's now paying $1,263 taxes. So of course, if we don't make any of the large properties pay taxes, and I've done a study, 155 properties worth more than a million dollars receive tax breaks totaling $30 million. Our total tax collection is $137 million last year. Roughly, of more, th more than a fifth of all our taxes are given to these large developers. If they do this, they have to get the money from somewhere. If we stop giving these tax breaks out, and we have programs for this, the downtown residential exception program, the commercial residential urban exception program, which give millions of dollars of taxes out. And they, when they give out these taxes. So when you talk about development, are there things that we can do better for our community? Absolutely. I wouldn't be sitting here running for mayor if I did not believe that. But there is the money that he's talking about comes from a completely different source of funding. You cannot use it for the purpose that he wants you to use it for. And if you and if you could, you know, there are dollars like community block grant dollars that you could use to, to invest, reinvest in the community. And I would take a look at that. But the source that he's talking about that this funding comes from, you cannot use it for that purpose. And so let's be clear here. When we make decisions, you look at the entire picture. When you look at what's happening at College Town, many people come here from all over the country to go to Strong Memorial Hospital, right? Even we do utilize that particular hospital. There is nowhere in the city where you could go and buy, if you had to run here, toiletries or a coat or some stockings or some underwear for that matter. You have to go somewhere else. So why not spend the money and invest in your own community so you can provide jobs to that particular community? Because that's what will also come from construction jobs as well as the permanent jobs that will be there. And so you have to invest somehow, some way. And that's a way for us to do that. The, uh, can I have a minute on this? I'll mm -hmm. be brief. The loan she's talking about and that I'm talking about is a Section 108. These loans are allowed for several purposes, providing essential resources not present in the neighborhood and alleviating blight are the two that would apply to this area. Who would pay it back? These, <laughs> loans, these loans can be used for any purpose that falls within that. Who would pay it back? You would expect these people to pay it back? You're already talking about their, their taxes going up. Right. At least, at least okay, with the I'm developer, they at, at least with the developer, the developer would be able to pay the money back. Can I finish now? Yes. Thank you. Get an extra minute. Thanks. The uh, the the point on this is the property that we're talking about is assessed for was be, is being built for around ninety million dollars. Their taxes have been set as if the properties were $37 million, which means they would pay $1.7 million in taxes. But out of that $1.7 million, $1.1 million, roughly, is being used to pay back this loan. So actually, they're going to be paying, four, roughly, the city is going to get somewhere less than $500,000 taxes. They have basically lowered the assessment and lowered the taxes and allowed taxes to be paid 
to pay back this loan. That is in effect making it into a grant which is secured by all our taxes. And we're going to get to agree on this, and I know we are. But what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a loan which is being paid back by lowering someone's taxes and taking the money out of their taxes. And this loan could have been used for alleviating blight somewhere in the city. And I didn't see blight, and we're not getting any essential services into this either. So I don't see why it qualifies, and I don't see why it's serving a benefit for us. Can you go ahead, can you go I can answer that question, but I don't want to go back and forth about it because Now's the time. Um, it is um, the blight in the community was that there was a building that was there that needed to be demolished. Um, you're going to bring jobs, not only construction jobs, but other permanent jobs to the particular area, and the developer is going to pay back the money. It is considered a loan. A loan from HUD, not the city of Rochester, a loan from the federal government that is going to be paid back by the developer, which ultimately, once the building, once the property, um, currently, the property that he's talking about wasn't being taxed at all. So we didn't receive any income from it because it was owned by the University of Rochester. And so, um, you know, now we at least receive a benefit, we get dollars for it, we, we're given a loan out and the money will be paid back. If that $20 million and which you don't have, it's a different funding source. You can't take that and just say, oh, we're going to demolish this house or we're going to repair this house or we're going to do this with that particular um, house because who would pay the loan back? It's called taxes from College Town. If they paid full taxes, you'd have the money to pay back the loan. Thank you. Discussion and for, for coming out. Um, we don't have time for any more questions right now. I'll be around afterwards. I don't know if lovely are you sticking around. In, in all fairness to the city council, in all, in, in all fairness. In Rochester, we do not have a shortage of money. We have a shortage of something called compassion. Because if we have the best schools in the nation, which we do, and people are sending their children from Saudi Arabia to the oh, University yeah, yeah. of Rochester, mm -hmm. and we cannot come together and agree and solve our own individual issues, it's not money. Money doesn't solve every problem. When people go around and kill our children the on the streets, they are lacking compassion, and money doesn't fix that problem. Yes, can, I, can we count on you to be at the next meeting when we talk about these issues? If I get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you can get paid. <laughs> Money's not everything. Else. <laughs> so, so in fairness uh, to the Money's city council everything. candidates who came, we, we definitely want to do this like we promised. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Give them another hand. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna, I'm going to turn this part over to my, um, my counterpart. Okay, her name is Bonnie Cannon. She will do the question and answer for the city, for the city council. Thank you. It's good. You have to talk right into it. Okay. So glad to see you're all still here. Thanks for staying. We'll try to kind of condense some of this because we're going to be asking this, almost the same questions of the city council that we were asked a little while ago. But first, um, let me just say something about city council, give a little overview um, in terms of what city council basically does. So, City Council is the nine-member legislative body for the City of Rochester that works in conjunction